Hey, what's up, how you doing? Today we're doing part two of hernias. Ventral hernias. We talked about inguinal hernias. If you're watching this, make sure you watch inguinal hernias first because a lot of this will make sense. A ventral hernia and an inguinal hernia are pretty similar, except really just location. What we've done with this one versus the other one, we have only erased the stuff that didn't apply to inguinal hernias and changed it to apply to ventral hernias. What is a ventral hernia? Easiest way to think about it is the anterior abdominal wall. So anything that is on the front of your abdomen, if you develop a hole, that's considered a ventral hernia. A hernia, again, by definition, is just a hole in the fascia where something protrudes through it. It can be small intestine, it can be colon, it can be appendix, it can be part of your liver. The main reason we talk about ventral hernias is because of umbilical hernias. An umbilical hernia is a type of ventral hernia. It's the most common ventral hernia because people are born with them. Other types of ventral hernias are incisional hernias. You can have hernias at what's called the falciform ligament, where it enters into the abdomen. It has to do with being born as a child and connecting to your mother through the liver. Any type of incision, spigelian hernias, they're all different types of names for these, but these are all anterior abdominal wall hernias. The way that we fix them varies from time to time depending on the location. But the first thing that we need to focus on is how do I know if I do or don't have a hernia? With regards to signs and symptoms, the biggest one you think about is abdominal distension. If you have an area in your abdomen that is increasing in size and decreasing in size when you lay down or sit up, it very well could be a ventral hernia. The most important thing with a ventral hernia is a change in size. You'll see them sometimes where they're small and then they get big. That's what you're more worried about is that change in size. The pain varies depending on what you're doing. So if you're working outside a lot, if you're moving stuff, or you're getting up from a sitting position to a standing position, and you have difficulty and pain, that may be a sign that you have a very big hernia or one that is incarcerated or strangulated. What that means is it's just stuck in there or part of the intestine has died. People that have large ventral hernias, they can also complain of significant amount of bloating. That bloating is associated with their intestines getting annoyed or kind of pissed off when they move around because it squeezes on the intestines and all of the intestines are not designed to be squeezed about because it does cause bloating. When you bear down like you're pooping or having a bowel movement, it's called a valsalva, what you will see is your abdominal hernia stick out more. The other thing that people notice is when they develop gastroenteritis, they can actually have worsening of their gastroenteritis symptoms. So they'll have worsening abdominal pain just because their intestines are stuck underneath the skin. We'll go over what that actually means in a little bit. As, as far as constipation and diarrhea, everybody's a little different. Some patients that have constipation as their baseline will have diarrhea. Some people that have diarrhea will have constipation. The one thing that is true is that anytime you have a change in your bowel habits, people with ventral hernias sense that a little different. So what happens is if you didn't have a hernia, had a surgery, developed a hernia afterwards, and then now you have a hernia, your constipation or your diarrhea will be different. The other thing is again, weird stuff. People will always complain of when I eat this, this, this affects me versus when I eat this, this doesn't affect me. The biggest thing is sitting to standing. That's the one thing that everybody notices when they have a very large hernia or a small hernia that's increasing in size they will have an ability to where they struggle getting up. When they're sitting from sitting to standing, they kind of have to roll from one side to the other just to kind of work one abdominal muscle, rectus abdominis, and then work the other rectus abdominis muscle to help them get out of a chair. If you see someone with doing that as well as has a large bulge in their abdomen underneath their shirt, nine times out of 10, they have a ventral hernia. <clears throat> as far as how a ventral hernia works. So what you'll see is swelling on the anterior abdominal wall. What that is, is the bulge that you see, and that's just subcutaneous tissue and fat. When you peel that back, what you could see 
is your small intestine. So this is your fascia that's hanging out right here, this black circle. This is your intestines on the inside. The biggest thing with the ventral hernia is the rectus abdominis muscles. The rectus abdominal muscles would normally be like this, but what happens in a ventral hernia is those muscles kind of go out to the side. So that explains that when you do a valsalva, those patients will squeeze that intestine out and they'll just kind of squeeze it up and it'll stick out. The other reason is you have difficulty standing because these muscles are normally in the midline and now they're out to the side so it makes it harder to move around. When we talk about fixing this, there are two parts to it. One, putting mesh to cover the defect and two, bringing those muscles back to the midline. We'll get to that once we talk about diagnosis. As far as diagnosing a hernia versus not a hernia, the biggest thing is physical exam. Most patients come in saying, hey, I think I have a ventral hernia, and they have what's called a diastasis recti. A diastasis recti is basically a weakness in your abdominal wall. So your muscles are not lateralized. You don't have that hole in the middle that intestine is protruding through, but you do have an abdominal wall weakness. The easiest way we diagnose that in the clinic is to have you do a sit-up on the table. When you do a sit-up, what happens with a diastasis is that muscle bulges up like a big ridge, and it goes all the way down the length of your abdomen. With a hernia, when you do that, it just sits right where the defect is, and it's normal above and normal below. You can have a diastasis and a ventral hernia, and patients with diastasis are at higher risk for developing ventral hernias, but they're also usually separate. <clears throat> the biggest way to figure out whether someone has a ventral hernia or a diastasis or a lipoma or anything weird is a CAT scan. Ultrasound really doesn't play a part. With regards to history and physical, BMI greater than 40 puts you at risk for not only recurrence, but it also puts you at risk for having a hernia. So does smoking, infections, or cirrhosis of the liver. Smoking is the biggest one because you cough so much when you smoke. So you're stretching those abdominal wall muscles every time you have a cough. It also doesn't allow us to put mesh in, and we'll talk about that. As far as ventral hernia repairs, laparoscopic versus open, each has their own inherent problems and also benefits. Laparoscopically, you can get back to work a little quicker, but it's harder to close those rectus abdominal muscles to the midline laparoscopically, but it can be done. Versus an open procedure, it's a bigger operation, but you get better medialization of the rectus abdominal muscles, and you can actually get a better repair, I think, to close it. The problem with the open repair, sometimes you can't get all the adhesions down to be able to fix the hernia. When I do it, I usually do an actual combination of both. So I do a laparoscopic assisted open hernia repair. So what that means is I go in, do all of my lysis of adhesions, mobilize everything, and then I will make an incision that's a lot smaller and be able to mobilize those muscles so that the rectus abdominal muscles can be brought back to the midline. Mesh versus no mesh, again, just like an inguinal hernia repair, a mesh repair is ideal. Even if it's a small hernia or something smaller than six centimeters, some people go down to four centimeters. I usually use six centimeters as a good judge. I'll put a piece of mesh in. For less than six centimeters, I won't put mesh in. So larger hernias should always have mesh. And usually what we do is put the mesh either above where we reapproximate the fascia or below where we reapproximate the fascia. It just depends how thick your abdominal wall is, what I think your risk of infection is, and how close they are to a BMI of 40, whether they have a history of infection two years ago or one and a half, whether they have history of colon cancer or not. All of these play a part as to where you put that mesh. Last thing is whether it's elective or urgent. If it's an elective procedure, 
Typically, they are not cirrhotic, there's no infection, they're not smoking, their BMI is less than 40. If it's an urgent or emergent surgery, that means they have incarcerated or strangulated bowel, they have one of these other issues, and if that's the case, then we try not to put mesh in them or they have to have a second operation. So another way to look at it is mesh equals elective. No mesh usually means that it was an emergent or urgent case, whether it's incarcerated or strangulated or dead bowel, and we sometimes have to two-stage those procedures. A two-stage ventral hernia repair essentially means I go in, fix one problem, come back six months later, fix a second problem. You can do that sometimes when you have people that have like colostomies and they have a peristomal hernia, which is a hernia around the colostomy. Sometimes we'll go in, move that ostomy to the other side, wait six weeks, six months, and then come back and fix the hernia on this side. That can be, be done with biological mesh, which is mesh derived from human dermis, pig dermis, horse dermis, all kind of stuff or synthetic mesh. Synthetic mesh is essentially what it sounds like. It's made in a lab. Most of the repairs that we do for ventral hernias are done with synthetic mesh. The other thing that you gotta make sure when you do a hernia repair is determine where you're gonna put it above or below. If you are putting it below the fascia and you can't get it covered with peritoneum, then you need to consider using a mesh that doesn't adhere to small intestine because the last thing you want to do is fix someone's ventral hernia and then have all their small intestines stuck up to it which creates another problem so typically if you're putting mesh underneath the fascia close to intestine you either have to have it covered by peritoneum or some type of biological substance like surgicil or something that prevents adhesions now if you're putting it above the fascia doesn't really matter. It's not touching intestine. It's protected. In that situation, you then have to deal with seromas. Seromas are anytime you create a space and you close that space in the abdomen or anywhere on the body, the body heals by filling it up with fluid. That increases your risk of getting an infection in mesh that is above the skin, especially if they, excuse me, above the fascia, close to the skin, because that's where all the bacteria are going to come from. So it makes it a little harder to deal with. Now, if someone had like diverticulitis, you did a repair, fixed their diverticulitis a year later, a year and a half later, they developed a uh, ventral hernia and you want to fix it, you may want to put the mesh above the fascia as opposed to below the fascia in that situation because your infection is more than likely below the fascia coming up. And if it's above the fascia, you may have an easier time dealing with it if it gets infected. But again, that's a lot to deal with, and we'll probably go over some of that if there are questions that come up. As far as complications, it's pretty much all the same complications that you deal with in surgery. Pain, swelling, numbness, bleeding. The pain from a ventral hernia repair, you have to make sure that it's not infected. And that can be a little tricky. Ultrasound can help in that situation. Sometimes you have to stick a needle in it, but sometimes if you do that, you can bring bacteria into the area. You also have a hard time determining whether it's infected or not with just ultrasound, and you sometimes have to add a CT scan. Sometimes you just have to guess and see. Swelling is normal after ventral hernia repairs. It will go down with time. It takes usually about four to six weeks. The numbness usually gets better because we're not going lateral. Every incision is made in the midline, so the numbness should get a little better. Bleeding is kind of one of those things that happens. As far as incarceration, it usually doesn't happen after surgery, but it can. Incarcerated dead bowel can occur if your ventral hernia repair is not done correctly or it gets infected. So think of it as if you make a, if you have a 10 centimeter hole in someone's abdomen and intestine is through it, you go in, put a piece of mesh in, and it doesn't heal correctly, or part of it is attached to the wall correctly and part of it's not. You've then taken a 10 centimeter defect and turned it into a three or four centimeter defect. We know with hernia repairs that the smaller the defect, the more likely someone is to have incarceration or strangulation. So if your repair is not done correctly, or you tell your patient 
stop smoking and they continue to smoke, or you are a patient and you say, start lifting heavy stuff before your physician recommends it, or you're not using a support strap. When you lift, you can take a hernia repair and make it something very deadly. So that's something you have to watch until that mesh completely incorporates. Usually if you're about four to six weeks out, you don't have to worry about your small defect having a piece of colon or small intestine sneak through it. As far as it happening before you have your repair, infected tissue, again, is a contraindication to do a final repair. So in that case, you may end up using something like Vicryl mesh, which is one that dissolves over time just to close a defect down. Think of it as you come in, you've had a ventral hernia for three to four months, and all of a sudden it gets incarcerated and then small intestine dies. I actually posted something like that on Instagram a couple of weeks ago. If that is dead intestine, I can't fix your hernia and it has to be two-staged. So I will just get rid of the infected tissue, put you on antibiotics, bring you back in six months or two years, depending on how bad it is or how infected it is and how many comorbidities you have like smoking, diabetes, obesity, and then fix your hernia at that time. So anytime someone says we're putting in temporary mesh or vicro mesh, it's the same thing and it has to be two staged. Hope this answers the majority of your questions about ventral hernias. We've knocked out inguinal hernias and ventral hernias. Next, we'll go through hiatal hernias. You'll see how a hiatal hernia conversation is completely different than the ventral and inguinal hernia conversations. Let me know if you need anything. Put it in the comments below. DM me on Instagram or whatever, and we'll get your stuff taken care of. Hope this explains everything, guys. Take care.